Thank you. So I'll uh, kick off with a story I tell in the book. It's actually one of my favorite stories about Christ. I first learned it in high school, and it doesn't come from the Bible. It's a parable in Fyodor Dostoevsky's great novel, The Brothers Karamazov, in the chapter entitled The Grand Inquisitor. And in that chapter, he tells the story of Christ coming back to earth in the middle of the Spanish Inquisition, walking the streets of Seville. And the Grand Inquisitor of the church spots Christ on the street, and he has him arrested. He locks him up in a prison cell, and the climax of this chapter is the dialogue between the Grand Inquisitor and Christ himself. And in that dialogue, the Grand Inquisitor tells Christ, we the church don't need you anymore. We already carry out the work that you once stood for, but your presence here impedes the work of the church from getting done. And that's why he sentences Christ to execution the next morning. For the next half hour, I'm going to tell you about a new church in America, a church that has sentenced to death America's own true essence. I'll take you back to 1993, when I was in second grade, growing up in southwest Ohio, and that's when I heard Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech for the first time. That was the speech where he said, I hope my four children grow up in a country where they are judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. And that dream stuck with me. It meant something to me because it was the dream that allowed me to go in a single generation from being the kid of Indian immigrants who came to this country with almost no money to becoming the founder of a multi-billion dollar company. It was the dream that allowed me to achieve everything I ever had in my life. And I had served as CEO of that company for seven years. We developed drugs for patients who needed them. One of the ones I'm most proud of is a new FDA approved drug for prostate cancer. But I stepped down as CEO earlier this year to work on a different kind of cancer, not a biological cancer, but a cultural cancer that threatened to kill that dream that Martin Luther King had 60 years ago, that threatened to kill the dream that allowed me to achieve what I have in my life. And that new cancer is what we call woke culture in the United States. In order to understand a cancer, you have to understand the roots of that cancer. And I look at the two most dangerous ideologies in the 20th century were Nazism, which was identity politics on steroids, and Marxism, which was an oppressor-oppressed narrative on steroids. Put the two together, you get their love child here on American soil. That is modern wokeism. It is a new secular religion in this country whose belief system centers on the idea that your identity is based on your race, your gender, and your sexual orientation, full stop. It says that America is a systemically racist country, that if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged, that if you're white, you're inherently privileged, no matter your economic background, no matter your upbringing, your race and your gender govern who you are and the thoughts and ideas that you're allowed to have. And you don't have to take it from me. You can take it directly from the high priests of this new religion. Take Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, her words, not mine, a year ago, where she said that we don't want any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice. We don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. I'm going to fit, guess that I don't fit her description of what counts as a brown voice. But there's a really clever part about how this particular virus spreads. And it's this. If your race goes from being about your skin color to being about your voice, then any disagreement with that voice actually becomes evidence of racism. And so today, if you say that I'm not racist, that actually means that you are racist. If you say that all lives matter, somehow that means that you believe that black lives don't matter. If you capitalize the W in white, or you fail to capitalize the B in black, as of the Associated Press's definition last year, you're also a racist, and there is no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist. So when given the choice between pledging allegiance to this new religion and being tarred with the scarlet R, everyday Americans are choosing to bend the knee. And that has created a new culture of fear in our country. Fear of losing your job. Fear of your kids getting a bad grade in school. Fear of becoming a pariah in your own community. And that culture of fear has completely replaced our culture of free speech in America. And if you ask me, the best measure of the health of any democracy 
is the percentage of people who are willing to say what they actually believe in public. And right now, we are doing abysmally on that metric. According to a recent survey by the Cato Institute, over 60% of Americans, I want you to process that number for a second, 60% of Americans say they're afraid of expressing their true beliefs because of the current political environment. That is not America. That is not the country that my parents came halfway across the world to join. That is not the country I learned to pledge allegiance to as a kid. That is not the country that I want to see America become. We have a new red guard in this country, except instead of pushing the philosophy of Chinese Marxism, they're now pushing this philosophy of wokeism, where in the name of diversity, we have completely sacrificed true diversity of thought. In the name of democracy, we have sacrificed our most important ideals of free speech and open debate. In the name of inclusion, we've created this new exclusionary culture where certain points of view just aren't welcome. Wokeism today is not about challenging the system. Wokeism is the system. And the story of how we got here is actually an untold story that dates back to the 2008 financial crisis. Because what happened after the 08 crisis in this country was that in the eyes of the old left, big business was the bad guy. And what, corp what the old left wanted to do was to take money from those wealthy corporations and redistribute it to poor people for the benefit of poor people. But there was a newly ascendant progressive woke left at that time that had a different theory of the case. They said that the real problem in this country wasn't economic injustice or poverty. No, it was racial injustice and misogyny and bigotry. And that actually presented the opportunity of a generation for big business in this country to be able to go from being the bad guys to being the good guys if they just said the right things. Applaud diversity and inclusion. Put some token minorities on your boards. Muse about the racially disparate impact of climate change after you fly in a private jet to Davos. It was actually a pretty good life if you're in big business in this country. But the trade worked, where Goldman Sachs can go to Davos last year and say they're not gonna take a company public in the United States if its board is insufficiently diverse, where Goldman Sachs is, of course, the sole arbiter of diversity, and they do not mean ideological or viewpoint-based diversity, I can assure you that. They can do that, but ultimately deflect accountability for the actual business practices that the old left wanted to go after them for. They were happy to lend their money and their legitimacy to this new woke movement, but they did not do it for free. They had a new ask, which was that the new left look the other way when it came to leaving their monopoly power intact. That trade worked so masterfully on Wall Street, where you had a bunch of big banks that got in bed with a bunch of woke millennials. Together, they birthed woke capitalism. That's what allowed them to put Occupy Wall Street up for adoption. And then Silicon Valley copies the act. They say, this is actually working out pretty well for Wall Street. We want to do the same thing. So they agree to censor, or in their language, moderate any content on the internet that the new woke left did not want to see online. But again, they didn't do it for free. They expect that the new left look the other way when it came to leaving their monopoly power intact. You see, that's how this arranged marriage works. It is not a marriage of love. It is more like mutual prostitution, but it is working because each side gets something out of the trade, and the net result of that act was the illegitimate birth of what I call the woke industrial complex, a new leviathan that is far more powerful than what Thomas Hobbes envisioned 400 years ago, far more powerful than what our own founding fathers envisioned 250 years ago, and now the rest of corporate America is getting in on the act too. Coca-Cola would rather teach their employees how to be less white or issue statements about a new voting law in Georgia than it would to be able to deal with its own product's impact on the nationwide epidemic of diabetes and obesity, including, by the way, in the black community that they profess to care so much about. It's the rest of corporate America, thank you, one after the other getting in on the act. Nike is, is I was just talking about it backstage with somebody back. I can give you a thousand examples. Nike is one we were just talking about before this speech. Nike's a company that criticizes slavery 250 years ago without doing a peep or saying a peep about reducing its own reliance on slave labor today in Asia to source $250 sneakers that they sell to black kids in the inner city who can't afford to buy books for school. That is how this game is played. Now, there's an even more dark turn that this story takes in recent years where a new party shows up on the scene. It's a new guest on the act who turns this unholy alliance into a three-party affair. And that's the Communist Party of China. And I will tell you that they understand this game far more deeply than any of us do. There is even a Chinese word for wokeness, baitsuo, 
literally refers to woke white people in the United States and they use it to laugh at us. But even worse, they are now using it as a tool to advance their geopolitical agenda by creating a false moral equivalence between China and the United States. Listen really carefully to what they're saying. Xi Jinping, when he's now pressed on the Uyghur human rights crisis in the Shenzhen province, the first thing he says to the UN or to the EU is that Black Lives Matter shows that the United States is no better. His top diplomat came here earlier this year to the Alaska summit. And what he said was that China wants to see the US stop slaughtering black Americans and that China hopes the US does better on human rights. Now that would be laughable if it weren't for the fact that the newly woke corporations are lending implicit credibility to their claims. Take Disney. Just a couple of years ago says it cannot shoot a film in the state of Georgia if Georgia passes the equivalent of a new heartbeat bill, an anti-abortion statute. But last year, Disney goes to the Shenzhen province of China where it shoots Milan. Literally, this is ground zero of the Uyghur human rights crisis where there are over one million Uyghurs enslaved in concentration camps, subject to forced sterilization, communist indoctrination, and worse, in some of the worst human rights abuses we've seen by a major nation since the Third Reich of Germany and Disney shoots Milan there, does not say a peep until the end of the film. You could see it in the credits today where they thank the local CCP authorities for allowing them the privilege of filming there. The very authorities that have enslaved over a million people in their concentration camps. That is how this game is played. That's Disney, it's the NBA continuing to expand into the Chinese market, saying nothing even as it decries racial injustice here in the United States. It is LeBron James criticizing the general manager of the Houston Rockets for tweeting in favor of standing with Hong Kong. LeBron James is the first person that comes to China's public defense while denouncing American Daryl Morey for daring to stand with Hong Kong. That is how this game is played. Now, the reason why these corporations and their crony celebrities do it, you might ask, is actually very simple. It comes down to money. Because you see, what China has mastered is building a great Chinese wall to any company that dares to criticize the CCP, but they will roll out the red carpet to any company that criticizes the United States. So companies are doing what companies do. They have turned our own companies into Trojan horses to advance their agenda from within. We made a mistake in this country, dating back 30 years, where we thought we could use our money to get them to be more like us. Well, guess what? They have turned that game on its head where they are now using their money to get us to be more like them. And it's even worse. It's not even their money. They are using our money to get us to be more like them. We thought we could send Big Macs and Happy Meals and somehow that would spread democracy abroad and instead they have sent back Disney movies and Nike sneakers as Trojan horses to spread their values from within. That is the game we are contending with and they have been so successful at that game that they're now even using the same trick to be able to evade accountability for the origin of this pandemic, labeling any accusation that this virus originated in a lab in Wuhan where the data increasingly points to by calling or labeling that inquiry as racist. That is the game they are playing. And I am sorry to say China is winning. Woke corporations are winning. LeBron James is winning. Our celebrities are winning. Our companies are winning. The real losers of this game are the American people and American democracy as we know it. So we've got a little over 15 minutes left. I'd like to transition to talking about the solutions. I think you all know the problem well. I don't need to tell you more about that. I lay it out more in my book. But I would like to talk about what a better way forward looks like. And it's going to require an awakening of the conservative movement in this country. I'll tell you first about one of my heroes, Ronald Reagan, who in 1980 did what he needed to do to tackle the problem of his era. He cut government regulations, he cut taxes, he ushered in an era of prosperity whose fruits we continue to enjoy to this day in this country. And that's why he's one of my heroes. But I will also remind you of my favorite Republican hero, Abraham Lincoln, who 160 years ago reminded us that the dogmas of a quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. And what I say is that the dogmas of 1980 are inadequate 
to address the unique challenges that we face today in the year 2021. We need new solutions that recognize that the threat to liberty and prosperity in this country is not just big government. That may have been the case in 1980. Today, it is only half the story. It is this new marriage between big government and big business that is far more powerful than either one alone because it can do what each cannot do on its own. Let's talk about the issue of big tech censorship at the top of that list. Today, what you see from big tech is an argument that says that we're private companies that are free to remove what we do or do want to remove from our website. And according to even 1980-style conservative ways of thinking, that makes sense if you're actually operating as a private company. But today, we know that these companies are working hand-in-glove with the ascendant party in power in the United States to be able to carry out censorship online that the government could not carry out directly. The government in this country is now delegating its dirty work to the private sector to do through the back door what Congress could not do directly through the front door. And you know what I say? If it is state action in disguise, then the Constitution still applies. When these companies work hand in glove with the government, they ought to be bound by the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. Now, these same companies then go to the offline world and are engaging in censorship in our culture by threatening to fire any employees that defect from that orthodoxy. They were employees, numerous employees, fired last year for wearing hats with the name of one of two presidential candidates, one of whom came from a major party in the United States. That isn't the American culture that I know. Now, what I say is that if you can't fire somebody at work today because of their race or their gender or their sexual orientation or their religion or their national origin, then you should not be able to fire them on account of their political beliefs either. We need to add political expression as a civil right and a protected class in the Civil Rights Act in 1964, right there next to race, gender, sexual orientation, and national origin and religion. Now, I have to admit, there's a libertarian side to my brain that says that The last thing we should want to do, I used to think this way myself, is to impose another restraint on private businesses that prevents them from making decisions for themselves. That the market should work this out. That if these great businesses over here have an opportunity to hire conservatives that are being fired by silly businesses over here, the market should be able to work that out. But here's the thing. We have to apply those standards evenly. And if you can't fire somebody because they're black or gay or Muslim or white or Christian or Jewish or whatever, then you should not be able to fire them just because they're an outspoken conservative either. And this is not an academic issue. It is happening indirectly or directly every day in this country. If it can happen to the 45th president of the United States, it can happen to anybody. So so these are the kinds of policy solutions that I think the conservative movement needs to wake up to today. I lay out many more of those in my book. But even these legal solutions are really just a form of symptomatic therapy. What we really need in this country is a cultural cure. And I'm going to talk about a controversial subject that's near and dear to my heart that I want to see unfold in that cultural revival is the revival of the unapologetic pursuit of excellence in this country. I'll ask you to reflect on Simone Biles, one of the top American gymnasts in U.S. history, goes to Tokyo to compete in the Olympics, pulls out in the middle of competition. Naomi Osaka, one of the top female tennis players in the world, does nearly the exact same thing just a couple of months earlier, and the media cheers at every step of the way. Is that entirely unrelated to Naomi Osaka's decision to give up her U.S. citizenship just two years earlier in 2019? Is it entirely unrelated to intersectionality as a theory of identity for how young black women are supposed to think about themselves in this country. I don't think so. And I don't think that trend is just limited to sports either. Second generation Asian American kids are now afraid to outwardly pursue excellence in math and science because it's just not cool to be number one anymore. Standardized testing is ridiculed as racist. Talking about American exceptionalism is now considered gauche. I think that America's inner animal spirit, the animal at the heart of America, has been tamed. It has been domesticated by this new culture that penalizes excellence and rewards this new cult of mediocrity and victimhood. 
I think the pursuit of excellence and the pursuit of American exceptionalism are at the heart of what it means to be American. And the loss of those ideals leaves a deep moral and cultural vacuum in its wake. That's when dark forces begin to fill the void. When we hungered and rallied behind the cry to make America great again, we didn't just hunger for Donald Trump, we hungered for the unapologetic pursuit of excellence in our country itself. Now, I'll tell you how Dostoevsky ends that story of the Grand Inquisitor. Christ doesn't say a word as the Grand Inquisitor challenges him even as he is sentenced to death. But at the end of that story, Christ ends the act with a kiss on the Grand Inquisitor's cheek. And he's so shocked by that act, the Grand Inquisitor is, that Christ simply walks out the door and makes his way out into the horizon. That's how that story ends. That sets a very high example for us to abide by, but I will ref- cause it to reflect on what our path forward as a country may look like as well. It's not just about the pursuit of excellence that matters, but the civic foundation against which we're able to pursue our excellence that matters too. I'm not a big fan of policies that nakedly try to redistribute wealth for its own sake, as you may have seen in the USSR. But I do think that we on the right are overdue for a discussion not about redistribution of wealth, but about a redistribution of duty, of our civic duty. I think we need to be weaving civic education and civic service into every stage of our educational process. I look at the National Guardsmen who lifted people up out of Louisiana out of the worst hurricane since Hurricane Katrina just a matter of weeks ago and wonder what is so different about them from the rest of us that they were out there the next morning doing what needed to be done. I think we have a civic obligation today to bring back our Afghan allies from Afghanistan who stood for what this country ultimately stood for. We need to bring them back here and welcome them with open arms. But we need to bear those civic duties evenly. We can't just send them to Ohio and to Wisconsin. Let's send them to Beverly Hills. Let's send them to Martha's Vineyard. Let's send them to the Hamptons. Civic duties ought to be shared equally as Americans. And against that backdrop, we can tolerate inequitable outcomes if we begin not only under conditions of equal opportunity, but under conditions where our civic duties are carried out equally. And that begins in the next generation with educating our youth in our schools. Our schools are teaching our children to be ashamed of our history rather than to be proud of it. Patriotism is on the decline. Faith has nearly disappeared. What does it even mean to be American in the year 2021? I can't remember a time in my life where we more badly needed an answer to that question or lack of an answer to that question is the black hole at the center of our nation's soul. And when you have a vacuum that runs that deep, that is when the postmodern religion begins to fill the void. Wokeism is like opium for the American masses. It is opium for the American soul. But the right answer isn't to simply stamp out wokeism for its own sake. It is to fill that void with something far more rich and far more meaningful that dilutes the woke agenda to irrelevance. We have celebrated our diversity over the last 10 years. And make no mistake, our diversity as a country is a beautiful thing. But I think our diversity is meaningless without something that binds us together across that diversity, something greater, the ideals that we espouse together across our differences. Lacking that, I think our diversity is meaningless because we are then just another group of different looking higher mammals occupying a common geographic space doing what our iPhones told us to do on a given day. That is not America. America wasn't even a place. It was a vision of what that place could be. It was an idea that brought together an otherwise divided polyglot group of people 250 years ago. And at the top of that list of ideals was the dream that I told you about at the very beginning. The American dream. The idea that no matter who you are or where your parents came from or what language they spoke or what your skin color is, 
that you can achieve anything you ever want in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, and your own dedication. And by the way, that you're free to speak your mind at every step of the way. America is not a country that forces you to choose between putting food on the dinner table and speaking your mind freely between the American dream and the First Amendment. Together, that is the American dream as we know it. Now, the other side will say that that's actually just a load of high-minded drivel because America has always been imperfect. We are a flawed nation since the day that we were founded, and we have never lived up to our ideals. Well, you know what I say? Somewhere deep down in there, they have a point. America wasn't perfect on the day that we were founded. America hasn't been perfect ever since the day we were founded. America will never be perfect because perfection is impossible on God's green earth. But more so than any nation in human history, America was born on the idea that perfection is impossible. That's why we have a system of checks and balances. Our hypocrisy is only made possible by the fact that we have ideals in the first place. But more so than any nation on earth, America was about the pursuit of perfection, the pursuit of a more perfect union, the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of liberty, equality, and justice for all. Those were the values that won the American Revolution. Those were the values that reunited us after the Civil War. Those are the values that won us World War I and World War II and the Cold War, those are the values that still give hope to the free world. And if we can revive those common values over fractious group identity, then I say nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus is going to defeat us. That is what true American exceptionalism is all about, and that is what we will need to revive in order to defeat this cultural epidemic. Thank you. God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless our country. Thank you.